Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald, our assassinato, doing another one of my Master the HUD episodes. This one is entitled Grind Session. I'm going to keep the content coming fast and furious because for those of you who really enjoy that speed, I want to bring it to you. And for those of you who like things a little bit slower, hopefully the pause button is right there and you can make it slower for yourself. So hopefully everybody can get what they want. Now, let's get into this. Is poker a sport? I get asked all of the time if I consider poker a sport. There's an old joke from the card room. If you can do it with a beer in your hand, then it's probably not a sport. Then again, if you have ever played tournament poker throughout a five-day live event, uh, you know for a fact that this is a super physically exhausting game. The truth is, I don't know the answer. What I do know is that treating poker like a sport does lead to positive results. It blows my mind that in every competitive game on earth, there is a ton of practice, but 99% of poker players just play poker as their way to learn. I always say this joke. Do you know where Floyd Mayweather is right now? He's somewhere throwing a jab. That guy hasn't fought in years, but he still probably practices every day. If you did a standardized college entrance exam with myself and maybe 20,000 other professional poker players who have come and gone since 2006 when I started, I'm convinced that the vast majority of them would outperform me. However, most of these guys are not playing poker anymore because they just didn't show up for practice. Imagine a basketball player just couldn't hit free throws. Imagine he just never worked on that. Imagine his entire strategy to get better at free throws was to just try his best when free throws came up in a league game. Imagine he never hired a coach or even just did some structured practice with himself. Imagine he didn't even know that free throws are what he was supposed to be working on. How far would that guy go? That is 99.9% .9 of guys in poker. They talk with their buddies about free throws if they're lucky, but that never practice. And they call that studying. I'm able to still pay my family's health insurance and my rent and whatever else because I show up at practice and I play in the games I can beat. Maybe I want to play in the NBA, but truthfully, where I'm going to earn a pay paycheck is in Spain or whatever. That's just how life goes. Anyway. You will hear poker players say this all the time. I've been playing since blank year. I think I know what I'm doing. Just because you have been doing something longer than other people does not mean you're necessarily better at it. I went pro in 2006. There's kids who went pro in 2017 who are better than me. That's a fact. How did they become better than myself and many American pros who rode the first poker boom wave back in the mid 2000s? They practiced more efficiently. They devoured all the material that was already out there, and then they built their own drills around it. They didn't just go out on the court and hope their jump shot would sink. They practiced at home with their brothers. They worked on boxing to get, they worked on boxing out to get off offensive rebounds. They worked on free throws. They learned the key three pointers, and they worked on sinking them in an actual scrimmage. They learned to draw fouls and drive. They didn't just go play pickup basketball in the hopes that all of that would develop. You will never be done practicing. I have two coaches myself that I'm working with right now to work on weak spots of my game. I have a third guy I have to bring in at some point next year. This is what it takes to stay paying your bills. You have to practice every day to stay sharp. Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant were the best players on earth when they played. If anyone could coast, it was them, yet they practiced more than anyone. How to create drills. There's multiple ways to create drills so you can make sure you're training like a champion as opposed to some scrub who doesn't understand the weights. You can hire a personal coach. With the right person, this is the best bang for your buck because it's personalized. However, it's a real investment financially and a lot of times the guys that want to do that personal coaching, their time gets taken up. So yeah. Uh, so anyway, you can use videos such as this one which are recorded drills. And you can also make drills yourself. People always forget about that last one. Uh, the way I could memorize anything I studied is I would create a quiz around it. And then I would just carry it around with me during the day and look at them. Uh, weeks later, I'd try to study again and see if I could reproduce what I learned weeks earlier. Sometimes I would create multiple quizzes based on hands I studied. And then I would shuffle them with other quizzes. This, this is how I became a coach. I started doing lessons to supplement my bills. And people were surprised that 
I'd have specific bullet points prepared when I talked. It, those were all just from my playbooks. If I watched someone's hand history, I could identify the upcoming spot very quickly because it kept coming up in practice. Eventually, I made lesson plans based on my own drills, and that's what helped me get a foothold as a coach. People always forget that they can make their own drills. It takes time. Obviously, if you're not a professional, time is more limited, which is why videos like this are so important. Because you didn't make these quizzes, you can truly come in cold, not knowing anything about what's coming. By the way, guys, this slide goes with everything. If you want to get better at anything quickly, you have to pay for it oftentimes. If you find the right person, it's worth every cent. Uh, a few years ago, I destroyed my back. I couldn't work out, so I put a ton of weight on. I had to pay good money to get a guy who could rehabilitate my back and help me drop that weight. I was trying to do it myself, but it was worth the money to pay someone who could help me make sense of everything I was reading online. Luckily for you guys, if you're watching this video, you're on a site that brings you some of the best digital stuff and it's already curated, but don't be afraid to make your own drills yourself or hire someone if you want to really cut the line. How to avoid fancy drills. When I was fixing my back, I fired five guys before I stuck with the sixth guy for years. Uh, I kept asking the same question, how will this exercise translate to results? What I found was that many guys would come up with a fancy drill that made you feel like you were working, but it didn't actually do anything. The guy who actually fixed my back would give me five pound weights for rehab work. It looked like it wasn't doing anything, but when he explained exactly how it would work, it made perfect sense. It always got results. Results over busy work. Every drill should have tangible results attached to it. I would love to discuss huge bluffs and monster calls all day, but the truth is they don't come up that often. I have friends who are the least exciting players I've ever seen, and they're much richer than I am. They focus on the fundamentals, which are not exciting. When you watch NBA basketball, we'll just keep up with that analogy. The most exciting parts of the game are the alley-oops on the fly. Uh, those are complex moves that take practice to execute, but they never practice them. When you go to a basketball practice, they'll be working on passing, even though that's super boring. Why? Good passing creates good possessions. If you never turn over the ball, you give the other team less possessions and thus less chances to cash in their points per possession ticket. If you pass well and create more open, high ROI shots, that increases your equity for each possession. The other thing they practice a lot now is offensive rebounds because it creates more possessions. It's fairly, fairly straightforward. Just create more possessions, more chance to cash in your points per possession, more points, you win more games. It, right? Yeah, not super exciting, but it works. Today's drill. In today's drill, we're going to work on HUD fundamentals with a quick quiz I made for myself. When you're multi-tabling online, you have thousands of quick decisions a day you have to make with a HUD. In past videos, I held your hand through some of the quizzes to make them more clear. In this video, you're going to look at exactly what I see when I'm playing online. I'm going to kick up the speed on this one so it's more like online poker. If you're new to online poker or HUDs, I'd recommend pausing to get yourself more time. I use something like this before I play. It's like a shoot around before the actual game. This is how you lock in. Many of these quizzes will not look extremely hard to experienced players, but here's the deal. If you miss a bunch of these, or even like 10 or 20% of them, it, it's like missing layups. As you can imagine, this doesn't bode well for you once you have to start shooting from the perimeter. Don't worry if you miss a bunch of these. I'm purposefully picking up the difficulty so you guys can feel what it's like to be at the controls when a pro plays. These are flight simulators. We want you to crash on the simulator so you don't crash when you're flying the actual rig. I will keep making videos. Just keep doing them until it feels easier. Then actual sessions will feel great. A quick note. I'm not going to be telling you what the stats mean this time. For those with not terrific vision, I will read out the stat line, a couple of them. After that, you're going to be on your own. If you can see what hand you have, you're going to be able to see the stats. The way it works is VPIP, PFR, 3-bet. We're ignoring aggression factor while we do basics. We are, we are starting with the absolute basics, guys, okay? So it, it is going to be... It, it is going to be... Uh, 
just VPIP pre-flop raise three bet most like basic HUDs are going to give you these statistics along with the aggression factor you just need to know where they are you will have to contextualize these stats on the fly with their table positions stack sizes and bet sizes this is literally the most basic HUD you could have and it's exactly what I tell people to start with all right you ready to work take a deep breath this is going to go fast Oh, by the way, you're going to see my stats for the last 11,000 hands here. You're going to see I'm playing super aggressive, but that's because I've been playing a ton of micro stakes and small stakes games to show my students that excessive bluffing and three betting still works at these limits. I don't recommend that you play that aggressively almost ever, unless it's a huge Sunday major and everybody's terrified. Finally, all of these tournaments are the micro stakes and small stakes games I was playing and from the same... Uh, all the hands you're going to see today are from the same session. They're taken from a selection of tournaments that saw me winning a $1.65 tournament because I wanted to show people three betting and double barreling and all that still works there. So uh, that was pretty neat. I haven't played that low in a while. It was actually really fun. And uh, I, this is the same session. I final tabled a 22-6 max, so a lot of good hands from that. Uh, all of the tournaments are between those two buy-in levels, between like a dollar buy-in and like 22s. And the players more or less are cut from the same cloth. So once again, this is the most basic HUD at the smallest games. We're starting with the absolute fundamentals. Let's see how you do. Ready? All right, here we go. Facing a raise, what do you do? 24, 16, 5.6. You're going to get about five seconds because that's about all I get when I'm playing. All right. You got a couple of options here. The guy's stack is short enough and he's opening enough to do a three bet bluff. So well done if you pick that. Call is also fine with short stacks and a high card. If you ever want to go back to look at the hand, feel free to pause, rewind, all of that. I'm going to go pretty quick to make it something you can use before a session. All right, so let's say you call here. And let's go ahead. And the board comes eight of diamonds, seven of diamonds, three of hearts. What would you like to do here? All right, you check. You check and you bet 68,250 on you. You got five seconds. What do you do? Quickly, 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 quickly. You have other tables. Somebody's talking. You raise it up. The check raise here is beautiful. Your opponent is missing this board over 50% of the time if they have opened 25% of the hands and are C-bet bluffing when they miss this flop, which is very likely given his numbers. His stack size is in trouble versus this check raise size, which needs to work less than 50% of the time. Three seconds, what do you do here? You like that taskbar? There's going to be crap all over your screen. You like me talking? There's going to be noise in your house. The kids need something. Wifey wants to talk to you about something. The other tables are beeping. What do you do? Quick. Three seconds, you should know the answer already. The other tables are beeping. It's a fold. This is the only one I'm not reading the stats on, but you notice, I mean, I'm actually not gonna do that a lot. Okay, I didn't wanna highlight this one, especially because it would have been so obvious, but you notice how if someone doesn't highlight it and there's distractions, you can't see it? Yeah, you got a great pot odds price, right? Wrong, a 12-3 opened under the gun. The worst thing that could happen to you versus this guy is you hit a pair, he's always got the over pair, muck. 3% raise preflop, 3%. But what's the real problem? Did you see it? This happens all the time. The HUD didn't update. That's the wrong HUD you're looking at. Now what do you do? You restart it, stop HUD, start HUD. Here we go, one more time. Here you go, there's the real stats. Uh, the first person, 26-15. The second is 17-11. All right? Your move. All right, I'll give you five more. I'm feeling nice today. 
By the way, guys, when I'm getting getting hard on you, it's because I love you. I, I'm not, I don't mean it. It's a shtick. I have to do something to differentiate myself as a coach. This is how my football coaches taught me. It sticks in your memory when people talk to you this way, right? Because it's contrasting. <laughs> okay. So anyway, it's a fold. It's still a fold. Pot odds is not an excuse to call with everything. You have a jack in an ape out of position in a multi-way pot. But what's the biggest problem? The cold caller is tighter. He's a 17-11. He also has no three bet, so he's not three betting uh, his best hands there. He's cold calling from very early position. You're going to run into a lot of good hands here versus an under-the-gun raiser too. He only raises 15% of the time, even if his VPIP is much higher. A couple hands later, the 17-11 uh, raises. What do you do? You know what? I'm done reading out the stats. <laughs> if you can see what hand I have there, you can see the HUD. Part of the difficulty in multi-tabling is eyeballing this. No one is going to be there to read these to you while you're playing. If your vision isn't great, put this up on your big screen in the living room and play fewer tables when you're grinding. Let's go. What would you like to do here? All right. Uh, you got one less squeeze stack there in the big blind, which helps you call. Uh, so that's fine. But the under the gun plus one raiser has an 11% preflop raise in his short stack. So this is never a three bet. I would honestly fold here probably 90% of the time. Uh, cold calling in general can lose you a ton of money. If you look at most databases where people lose their ass off, is just, I have a really good hand. I can't three bet it. But I don't want to fold it because what if I hit the flop? And if you actually look at, like you filter for like cold calls, a lot of guys are losing way more money than if they just folded and just consented to losing the ante. So you got to be really wary of this. If you ever want to double check the situation, by the way, rewind the footage. I'm going to keep rolling to simulate a real session. You call the big blind jams. Uh, you guys call. The board comes 10 of diamonds, 8 of diamonds, 6 of clubs. Let's just say you called here. Okay. Couple of seconds. Other tables and BP. And what do you do? Quick, 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 quick. All right. You call. Turns the ace of hearts. He checks to you. What do you do? Uh, 1.2 million in the pot. All right. Bet 323,000. He folds. You know how he had nothing on that? You know how you knew he had nothing on that flop? One, only one card was nine or higher on that board. That doesn't slam a typical person's raising range, which is loaded with high cards. That's why we're floating here. Okay. Two, he bet one fourth pot on the 10 8 6 double suited board. Do Nitz bet that small with any overpair on that board? He told you he had high cards. He doesn't have the chips for a double barrel bluff on the turn. This is a very safe float. You actually don't even love the ace peeling off because he has a bunch of aces. You bet smaller to get any garbage pairs to call in hopes you have a draw. Uh, okay, Queen Jack here, guys. Take a look real quick. All right. few more seconds. Okay. Raise to 2x. The only person with a 3-bet to your left also has a stack he can't 3-bet from. That would be this gentleman. It's more, more or less a uh, rejam stack there, about like 20x. Uh, you would love it if the big blind called you. And just because like these nitty players are really out of sorts when they call. Uh, nobody else really has a three bet, so bombs away. You get two calls. All right. Board comes queen eight six. Check to you. On you. What do you do? <clears throat> this one is subtly difficult. Uh, you want to bet a little bit bigger here. So if you pick C or D, I appreciate that. Uh, when you're in a multi-way pod and you hit, you want to bet bigger at micro stakes and low stakes because these guys play more or less the same multi-way. 
They assume somebody has something multi-way, so they fold their high cards, call with pairs, and raise with their two pair and better combinations. Uh, the thing is, they don't really look at bet size. Versus small bets, they'll probably still fold their high cards. Versus bigger bets, they'll still probably call with their pairs. It's close to impossible to get a low six player to fold six seven here, uh, even if you bet three four spot. That said, the big blind is nitty, so we go on the smaller end of the spectrum here. And we get called by H Rampage, and the turn is the nine of hearts. What would you like to do? You have five seconds. All right, there you go. It's a check. You check. He bets 192,000. It's on you. What would you like to do? You have five seconds. The other tables are going. Another one. You got aces on another table. What do you do? Oh my God. Uh, got it. You got to click. Got it. Uh, uh, time bank's coming up. Did you click it fast enough? This is a fold. I'm sorry, guys, to be that mean, but this is how a lot of sessions are going to be going. You're facing a really huge bet. There's a lot of pressure on you. And you know what most people do when there's a lot of pressure on them? They just call. And that that would have been a disaster here. Because this this is a massive bet. This this gentleman is... You, you just started playing with this gentleman, but you do have a bunch of hands on him. Like, you just started playing with him in, like, close quarters co combat at this table. Uh, he's a 28-10 that is not an aggressive player at all. He essentially just bet 2x pot on this turn because it's unlikely he bet 80% of the pot with half his chips and is folding to a shove. That is very important to pay attention to when someone more or less moved all in without moving all in because you can count those bets as bigger and get a lot of information from them. The name of the game isn't put him on one hand that you beat then call. Whenever you're fe facing a big call situation, what is the most important question to ask yourself? Does he do this with X? X is the best hand that you beat. X in this hand would be queen 10. That seems extremely unlikely that he just, we checked here and he just went bombs away with queen 10, right? So now you have to look at the draws. How many draws does he do this with? Because most people don't just do the total air ball bluff. They need some kind of draw. So, Let's first we look at the value hands. Now we look at the draws. How many draws does he do this with? Well, there weren't many he could call with on the flop, and most of them have hit a pair with their draw on the turn, so they're more likely to check back and see a river. This looks a lot like king queen or ace queen. That's just like low stakes silliness, or a set, set that's just really terrified of a heart. Nine seven would probably check back. Jack ten got there. Jack ten's totally. Um, high cards, like if he just had like a seven, that probably gets mocked. I, I don't know if he mocks the gut shot. So we have to think about a few of those combos. Nine, nine got there. Uh, 10, 10 and Jack, Jack would check back. Seven, five suited got there. It, it's just, it's really difficult to give him a hand. You beat here. Four, five suited deep in a micro six tournament. Your move. Give you a couple more seconds with it. All right. Couple more. Uh, no three bets percentages to your left. Start looking at that. Uh, the one guy who has a rejam stack. Uh, I mean, excuse me. The one guy who does have a three bet percentage has a rejam stack. Uh, the biggest stack has a three bet of 2.4%. Most stacks are in that awkward too big to jam. Uh, the most stacks are in that awkward too big to jam, too small to three bet territory. We love when we do loose opens. This is one of those spots in tournaments, guys, that people don't focus enough. Is like if nobody three bets you and you get heads up with the big blind, it's just money in the bank. So you always got to be looking for those spots. Like if if everybody is just three betting the bejesus out of you when you open, you got to be really careful about opening. And you see a lot of people just indiscriminately open the same hands all the time. And that's just lighting money on fire. If you can imagine like 2x gone, 2x gone, 2x gone. Well, that's a pretty big deal when your win rate is like, you know, in three hands, you just pissed away 6x and your win rate per 100 hands is like seven big blinds per 100. But there, there's also like when you can pick up money because there's nobody's three betting because it's a low stakes tournament. And you're just not opening because like I don't open four or five suited from this position like nine, 90 percent of the time. But when you we have like 22, 13 timid player, 18, 18, 18, 13, 23, 12, 28, 10. These are all timid players. Nobody is three betting. 
If anything happens, I'll be seeing a flop. In which case, I'll still make money. Just not as much. We raise and get two callers, okay? Going to make like some fractions of a big blind, but not much now. Okay, so we get called. The board comes king six six. It's checked to us. What would you like to do here? You need to know this off the top of your head. The other tables are clicking. Okay, that's it. This is a third pot bet. Just bet small. One third pot only needs to work 25% of the time. And both players have high cards more often than that. Probably any bet will get them to fold high cards multi-way. All right, let's just hop into another situation. Here you are, queen 10. Uh, right there, okay, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds. All right. There we go. What would you like to do? Huh. This is a fold. You got a fold, guys. No matter how tight the blinds are and how deep you are, you have an 11% pre-flop raise. Raising from under the gun plus two. Your queen 10 is dead in the water. All right. Deep in a low stakes tournament. Let's go. There you go. I, I didn't give you enough time with that slide. Sorry, guys. Okay. Take, take a few more seconds. Sorry. <laughs> That's about how quick you got to read them, but uh, I forgot we're training today. <laughs> Should give you a couple more. All right. This is how they train quarterbacks, by the way. It's just like, here's a defense, and then in three seconds, you got to spit out what you see, right? It's like, it's so unfair when they, like a QB washes out of the league. People are like, oh, that guy's such a scrub. It's like, literally, that guy probably, like, it, it, like, people were saying, like, how could Mark Sanchez be an analyst? It's like, he probably can read the defense in, like, 4.1 seconds, whereas Tom Brady's, like, 2.8. Like, that's the difference. You know? And it's like, he's still a lot better at football than you, man. <laughs> like, it's just, it's crazy how small the difference is. And, like, when you're playing, you know, like, the 23-year-old kids, like, the acuity, that's the thing that online poker is really... Online poker, when you're young, the, the one thing that really can set you apart is like if you ever watch like esports, like you'll notice a lot of like young kids can have some advantages because they're just so lightning quick with like pointing their mouse around and shooting. And like poker is a little like that. Like you see it, you got it, boom, right? But as you age, like you know, now I'm in my 30s, not as rapid fire. It sounds dumb, but like if you watch esports, you know, it's a uh, Guys, uh, as you get a little older, you get a little more contemplative and you start thinking a little bit more. You got to do more drills like this, right? Just to keep up that speed. All right. I gave you way more time than you needed there. This one is a call. If you raise versus a guy whose preflop raises is 13%, you're just letting him play perfect from that stack of 40x. He'll shove ace, king, and jack, jack, and fold ace, jack. I, I typically really want you guys to be very careful about cold calling because a lot of guys can't do that really profitably. Actually, very few. Especially from this early position, you have three players to act behind. If there's ever a rejam stack to act behind you, that can uh, really affect you as well. But this is one situation your hand is good enough you could call. Back in the day, by the way, that was a fold. I, I know that's amazing to people watching, but like that's how I was taught poker. Like... Uh, what was the old phrase? Don't go broke with a queen in your hand. That was I heard that nonstop when I started uh, back in 06. All right, here. Give you a couple of seconds with this one. This one's fun. I'm having fun doing this video. You got a couple extra seconds because I wanted some of my iced coffee. All right. What do you want to do, gang? You should know already. All right, it's a race. You have to three bet for value versus a guy who's opening that much. It's a smaller sample, but, you know, I mean, this, this this guy came to play. He's gambling. We've played a few orbits with him. He's opening a ton. Normally, you got to be really careful about three betting uh, ver when you still have five players to act behind. Always take a look at the rejam stacks as well. Uh, but in this case, you, you can obviously call Murphy Durfee, and your hand's good enough to get away with it. So we raise and he four bets. All right. It's on you. Uh-oh, another table's clicking. What do you do? 
That's a fold. This happens all the time. The super active player there is calling you preflop 90% of the time, especially on the American facing networks. When he does four bet you, it's only good hands. He essentially just four bet 40% of his chips. Most guys won't do that in fold. So he really actually just shoved like 53x there uh, when he opened under the gun plus one and under the gun plus two, three bet him and has him covered. Uh, but it's worse than if he just shoved 53x because he kind of wants action when he four bets uh, smaller. He could be bluffing here, but it's not that likely. So what's the big question you have to ask yourself, guys? Does he do this with ace-jack? Okay. Most people aren't terrific at the out-and-out preflop bluff. So let's just start with that. Uh, and he's probably not shoving ace-jack for value. You make more money on average three betting here, even if on occasion you run into the hand and have to fold before seeing the flop, and database analysis confirms this. You just have to make sure you don't move all in at any point to see where you're at when you've lost. The three bet was good, keep it to that. So this is uh, this is a way a lot of people just like burn their equity alive. Uh, playing, which is, okay, loss aversion is a very real thing, which is uh, if you study uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, if that book's a little too dense, there's a fantastic book called The Undoing Project that discusses the writing of that book. If you study Nergo, Economics, uh, Nassim Nicholas Talia, blah, 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 there's a ton of them. What you'll end up finding is humans are, our brains are just like 50, you know, like very, very dated hardware. Uh, very old, uh, soggy computers are our brain and it, they're made for certain things which was when we were hunter gatherers if you consented to loss regularly like you could kill the tribe like if there was a hunt you could have secured and you didn't do it because you were sloppy like that could lead to everybody's death so uh, you know, if you were not protecting your kids, you were just like totally cool with leaving the young out there. Um, you know, obviously pretty bad for the tribe, right? Um, so humans have evolved to be very uh, resistant to loss. There's tons of studies they do. Well, I mean, the, the easiest one, if you guys want to read books about this, um, <clears throat> you know, there's the elephant in the brain, there's persuasion, there's influence, there's everybody lies, there's... Uh, just off the top of my head, lose or think, uh, win bigly, how to fail at almost everything and still win big, uh, off the top of my head, anti-fragile, uh, the undoing project, thinking fast and slow. You can really go really far down this rabbit hole and just studying how people manipulate markets and what people are very um, resistant to. Anything by Michael Lewis uh, will teach you quite a bit about this. And... The thing they find when they do studies is just people are much more resistant to a loss than winning doesn't feel nearly as good as losing feels bad. And you know this for a fact because no sale on earth has ever said gain $50. When I say that to you, that's probably really confusing. But when I say save $50, oh no, you only got a week. Come on, act now. Oh no, the $50 is about to be lost. We're about to lose the hunt to the tribe, blah, blah, blah. That makes a lot of sense because that's how we're wired. Now, I, I bring all of this up because a lot of people, when I show them this three bet fold, like their heads explode. Because in their book, that board could have come ace, queen, five. And they could have won a huge pot. Or the board could have come ace high. And they could have won a huge pot. And because we stupidly three bet an early position raiser, we gave him the opportunity to bluff us. You turned your hand into a bluff here. Well, did we? Let's be honest. A lot of people play this hand pretty straightforward. Um, this is an American facing network and Americans have a very big problem with flatting three bets. That's not something you see internationally as much. And, you know, it's possible he's not um, indicative of this site. But if you're running and gunning and you see a 38, 32, that's a pretty uh, safe assumption to make, which is this guy's going to call too much. So 
a lot of times they call you with all the weaker aces. They call you with uh, king queen. They call you with queen jack. They call you with queen ten. But um, they format like ace king jacks, queens eight kings aces. So it's a really good idea to three bet maximize the amount of money versus the vast majority of hands that you're beating and just get the hell out of there when he four bets and he's got better. But because we're so worried about what that flop would have come and all the potential money we just lost because we gave him an opportunity to re-raise us, we just cold call. Well, I invite you sometime to go through your database and do cold call all in pre-flop falls. And take a look at how that's going. And you'll find a lot of guys just, a lot of us can make that work. Especially, um, because here's the thing when you cold call, and I, I'm totally going off my uh, notes. But th this is very important to me that you guys understand this. The, the problem is when you raise, there's a lot of different ways to win. When you're raising and betting, there's a lot of different ways to win. You could have the best hand and you could be firing in the worst hand calls, which is fantastic. Now you're going to win a really huge pot. You could have the worst hand, but a big hand could uh, a better hand could fold. You could have the worst hand, but the guy could just call you and start giving you free cards, in which case you keep firing once you make a better hand, but you uh, don't if you don't catch up, which means the bigger pots are pots where you're winning and the smaller pots are pots where he's winning, which... Obviously, is fantastic, and position is a big part of everything I just discussed. Now, when you're cold calling, there's only one way to win. You must have the best hand, and it must remain the best hand. Now, all of us know that isn't that likely to happen sometimes. You can have years that doesn't happen, and especially when you cold call and you invite like half the table into the pot with you. If there's four people trying to run down your hand post-flop, Chances are someone will do it because they sure as hell aren't going to fold. So you'll have years in poker where things just go fantastic, where you keep, you know, your hands keep holding, right? And then there will be a year where your hands don't hold and everybody goes, I, I can't win a pot. I can't do anything. Well, I, it's, I'm running so bad. And it's like, well, it, truthfully, we were probably running a bit ahead of expectation. This happened to me as well, which was, I, I ran above expectation one time when I was younger. And then it wasn't until I started doing analysis where I realized like, man, I got to get back on the ball, man. I used to, when I was starting, I was way more assertive in creating these big pots in position with superior hands versus weaker ranges and making money. And I just got complacent. You got to get away from that. Okay. So let's continue. All right. So here, gentleman goes out and raises. You are in the big blind. I'll give you a couple of seconds. All right. What would you like to do? And just slam the desk. That's that's what they teach you to do when you make content. If your mic is right there, just slam the desk. People love that. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway, uh, this is the call. You want to call versus this tight of a raising range. If you re-raise, he'll love it. He can just get it in with everything better than your hand and fold worse. So we call versus the 13% preflop raise. Good job. And let's go to the next hand. So we have 10 nine of spades. If that was disorienting, that was on purpose. Because that's how it is. Another table popped up. You ready? Uh, it's a totally different situation. Uh, quick, quick. Uh-oh. You got aces. You're timing out. The kids need some. What do you do? This is a raise. Here you can raise the 2x because there's no one three betting behind you. The one high three bet percentage is Oleg, and he's normally pretty tight. So it's likely that three bet just came around from jamming. I didn't give you a ton of time to look at this because, guys, that's how it's going to be sometimes. All right. And you can still read this fairly fine. Anyway, how the numbers are color coded. You don't even have to see specifically. You get three bet. What do you do? <laughs> quickly, 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 quickly. Six tables. Oh boy. Got to do what I got to do. That's a fold, everybody. Uh, this is a tighter player, a control player, and he just re-raises 3.5x your amount from about a 30x stack. He's essentially moved all in here. Uh, he's most likely never folding if you jam. You don't really have the pot odds to call. He, he's also, you know, he's a... If this guy was just a psychopath, maybe we could like justify implied odds or something like that. And there, that does happen on occasion, but an 18-14 is just not going to be paying you off. Like you want to be... 
You know, like in in cash games when you're like 200x deep, this is like an auto call because you could make like a goofy straight and he could make a set and now you're getting like a 400x pot. But like here, the stacks are so short. What's most likely going to happen is you're going to make a pair and when he has a hand, it's going to be better than your hand. So you make a pair, he makes a pair, his pair is better. You get all the money in. Uh Uh-oh. Now we're negative EV right there, right? So... He's most likely never folding if you jam. You don't have the pot odds to call. This is one of the biggest leaks I see now with guys. They call every re-raise in position indiscriminately, even if the guy's kind of a tight, aggressive player who's never paying you off when you hit and typically will only get you it, get it in there with you when he's got you killed. He's never doing this without a big hand. If this guy were a 24-18 with a 13% three bet, then you have a case for a flat, but here you don't. All right, here we go. Let's try another one. You min raise and get three bet by a larger stack. What do you do here? Three seconds. Quickly. Go. That's a fold too. This is a fold as well. The three bet on this gentleman is 6.8%. That's mostly value hands and you're out of position versus a huge three bet. Uh, I just spent a couple weeks looking at databases for people and I cannot tell you how many guys I saw torch their win rate with lazy tilty calls and spots like this. 6-4 6-4 diamonds. All right. The very next orbit, he does this to you again. What do you do here? It's still a fold. It's still most likely a hand. Don't let your temper get in the way of good poker. The numbers don't lie. Also notice he has a short stack in the big blind he has to call. That will dissuade some guys to play. Okay. Here, another low stakes gem. <laughs> what do you do here? All right, few seconds. Oh, you thought it was a three bet because I'm the three bet guy. I'm the one who wrote that book about three betting all the time, right? No, short stack on the button is raise preflop is only 15%. There's less money in the middle for him to fight for on the hijack. This is a fold, guys. All right, ace, queen of spades. No, it's not a chair. Let's go. Gentlemen. All right. This one's confusing, right? I'm going to give you guys a couple more seconds with this. This is, if you don't just read these for a living, did you catch it's a raise and a re-raise? All right, there you go. It's a straddle. All right. Um, this is one of those strange situations where you could probably justify everything. It is a raise and re-raise from under the gun and under the gun plus one. So if you said fold, like, honestly, I was such a nut peddler when I started and that carried me to such a good life. I totally get it. Um, but the guy has an absurd 22% three bet. Did you see that? That's insane. Okay, so um, you'll see this sometimes at low stakes where a guy is just gambling up. You have to try to bust these guys before they give all their money to someone else. Get involved somehow in this spot. You even have a case for a four bet call. Um, okay. So here, another one. There you go. You got three seconds with this one. All right. That's a full two. This is a 7% preflop raise. It was raising from under the gun from a shorter stack. And you have a jack and an eight. This is something. I just want to talk about this a second, guys. When I talk about three betting a lot, I, I, I do that because I know most people will open up their three bet like the tiniest bit, right? Most, like 99% of people are very scared about three betting a ton because... The the thing about poker is, well, like ostracism used to mean like certain death. So our brains are pretty evolved to not want to play in a way that is very embarrassing when it doesn't work, right? So most people won't three bet enough. So I'll, I'll be like, you got to three bet, you got to three bet, you got to three bet. Because it's kind of like, a, you know, you're trying to get a guy with the yips to get in there and play. Like you try, you know, like you got a guy who needs to get in there and fight, right? And you got to fire him up. You got to fire him up. But that doesn't mean like run in there and just start wildly throwing haymakers. No, 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 no. Take your time with it. Pick the right guys. Target very effectively. Look for the people that aren't raising 7% of the hands on the gun. Okay. 
Let's try something a little harder. How about this one, guys? Okay. All right. That's a fold, too. This is still a fold. This player is too tight at 18, 14. It's too likely to be a good hand. Like, you're forgiven. Like, if you three bet there, like, I get it. Um, I truthfully probably wouldn't because the 14%. Here, here's the thing. I, I, I really want to point this out to you guys. Um, sometimes you'll be playing and, okay, when you see 24, 16, the, let's, let's take a look at a lone wolf, okay? So let's say a lone wolf, like, raised in that spot. What will happen a lot of the time is there's a, what the hell do they call that in negotiation? I think it's called like anchoring. So like they did this test. So like uh, men and women would go like negotiate for their salary and they go like, so what are you looking at for this job? And like the person who was like interviewing for an IT job would say like $2 million jokingly, right? And everybody would laugh and the final salary would end up being higher than the people who didn't do that joke. Why? Because that was the first number that anchored everything in everybody's head. That's when they why they tell you negotiation, like start with, you know, the high number that's kind of ridiculous. And then the the number you actually settle on will will end up being much higher. Now there's something like this when you're looking at these, which is the first number just sticks out in your head. So a lot of people say, like, oh, I, I probably should re-raise re this 1814 or like this 2416. Well, it's like their preflop raise is actually not that high. Like 14%, 16% is not that high. And this is an earlier position. So like if you wanted to fold here, I'd probably end up folding a lot of the time. I think that's fine. But, but the problem is the first number sticks in your head, right? And I've done this a hundred times, which is, uh, that's why we were featuring a lot of hands with that guy previously who was a 28 10 because you just see that 28 and it's like, oh my God, this guy's playing like, 30% of the hands, but he's raising like 10% of the time. He's not aggressive. When he takes an aggressive action, you do have to be worried. Okay. Six max tournament this time. What do you want to do? Okay. A few more seconds. All right. That's a fold still. This was still a fold because while the guy is very active with 32, 18, 12.7 numbers, you'll notice his more normal number is the preflop raise at 18%. Uh, he's raising under the gun. Our hand is easily dominated and we're out of position. We're out of here. All right. Uh, take a look at this one. Okay, gloves. I'm just going to let you know. I'm just going to let you look. Just like, just like I got it. By the way, my HUD is way messier than this. Like you're talking literally like 20 numbers, you know? I'm really starting with the basics. All right. Uh, this is a fold too. Uh, well, under the gun plus two here does have a 12% three bet and is active. He is, uh, he's raising an under the gun player who is extremely tight and has five players, uh, in, there's five players also acting behind him. Um, so these fives have to hit the mock. Like we we just can't be cold calling here. It's so likely like the under the gun. I mean, the guy just plays nothing. It's so likely you're just going to get jammed over. And it's such a disaster to your win rate when you call there and then muck. And like you're not hitting the flop that much. Your implied odds are not that much. And there's still people to act behind you, you know. These fives just barely have to hit the muck, but they do have to hit the muck. I, I watch guys on their databases like torch big blinds with bad cold calls like this constantly. Okay, so here we go again. Small stakes. What do you do? Right, I'll give you a few seconds. Ugh. Uh, his preflop raise is 14%. He's raising into four people. Uh, you can be get forgiven for three betting here. That's okay. I uh, really don't want to be calling. Uh, 
you can be forgiven for three betting here since the players behind you are so tight. You could think he's raising more than normal, but most low six guys, players don't pay attention to that or use a HUD. Generally, you want to fold here. It sounds really weird, but I really like showing you guys the folds. Because I, I feel like sometimes poker trainers, like, it's it, we always want to be like, okay, be, look for this. Like, y you want to help people do the more complex moves because that's what people hire you to do is like teach me how to play like a professional poker player and that's like yeah of course like let's let's dissect like the stuff that might look really complex but isn't too complex when we discuss the mathematics and whatnot so you know that's the double barrel bluffs the three bets c bets uh the big value bets or whatever but you know like quizzing wise uh you know if i just did a bunch of pre-flop folds that's uh, that, that, that's not really uh fair as for, you know, that certainly makes my job easy. Uh, but I really love uh, just getting to mix these in with you guys because it's like, it's so much trickier, right? Yeah, and it's like, you just don't know if it's the, the hand's gonna start up and get cranked up and you gotta be looking for something or is it like just eject right away? You raise in the six max tournament and get re-raised. What do you do here? Was he talking about a fool because this time he plays? Yeah. he <laughs> Was he trying to psych you out this time? He's never. Okay, guys, one more time. I want you to pay attention to this, okay? Take a look at his stack. Now, a lot of people say, like, I don't know, man. That's a big three bet. He's coming after you. You're a button opener, all right? But look at his stack. This is a very difficult one, okay? Look at that stack size. He's never folding when he three bets that sizing from a 30x stack. You're essentially calling a 30x jam if you shove here. Except it's worse than that because he wants action. Do you really think he's doing that with 5-5 five, five or a6 suited? You're really running into it here even if his three bet is 13.6%. The numbers always need to be contextualized with stack dynamics. All right. Take a look at this one. Uh, you typically want to raise limpers when they look like they'll be susceptible to a C-bet bluff. This 3618-21.9 looks like he wants to party. So, yeah, so like when I have my big HUD here and somebody limps, I, I just look at fold to C-bet, like just all the time. And if, it, if it's high, I just raise here just very high. It's very exploitative exploitative, which means it's exploitable. But, you know, when I'm showing, you know, uh, trying to display how aggression can still work in micro stakes and small stakes, like the number of guys who actually can see where you're inconsistent and unbalanced at those stakes, especially on an American facing site, you can just count on one hand. And okay, <clears throat> so we we check, and on this board, you check call with second pair. I'm gonna fast forward through the decisions I think we a lot of us would agree on. And on the turn, we check, and he fires again. What would you like to do here? This one's a fold as well. The check raise probably won't work if he has any semblance of a draw or hand. If you call, you have to know he's most likely firing river, and most people aren't willing to call that bet. This is a fold. Like, there, there's very few cards that are good for you on the river, other than, like, a five. Uh, you know, a six is bad, a seven is bad, an eight is bad, a ten is bad, a jack is bad, a queen is bad, a king is bad, a club is bad. And yet, this is where you see a lot of people just lighting their money on fire. Just like, I, I got a pair. I think he could be bluffing a club. I call him. It's like... Do you think the 36, 18, 21.9 is <laughs> giving up on the river? I think he's fighting. What, what, you know, what, what card are we looking for? All right, here we go. So take a look at this one. Big blind is 900. So you min raise. And we get three bet by Og Dog. All right. On you guys. 
This one is a raise all in. This is the table psycho at 38, 35, 16.7. And he's pressuring a stack he doesn't feel can for bet fold, and he's got a ton of chips. Uh, it's time to party with this one. You got to put it in. All right, here, another one. Raise from the cutoff. And we get three bet on you. I'll, I'll give you a couple more seconds. The options are all in collar fold. Just be prepared. All right, there you go. You get three. All right. That's a fold. This one is a fold because the guy is almost never three bet folding from that stack size. So it's effectively a 30 big blind shove. He could be bluffing, but it's far less likely than in the last hand where the guy had infinite chips to three bet fold from. This is a pass in my book. All right. Tens facing a raise on you. What do you do? And if it feels like it's going fast, guys, that's kind of how it is when you're playing online. I'm, I'm getting you prepared. It's much better you crash and burn here. This is a call. It's much better you crash and burn here than at the table. This is a rare situation where you can cold call preflop. That's 16% preflop raise. Remember, that's an average. It's likely tighter than that from early position. You have a lot of people to act behind you. Um, so, yeah. If we three bet, like, eh, you know, I would prefer we were doing that from a later position. So we cold call. Everybody folds around, which does not happen that often. I guess the big blind had exactly 7-2 off. And we get a C bet here. All right. Take a good look, everybody. Your options are going to be fold, call, raise to 5.4K, or raise all in. All right. Which one would you like to do? Two seconds. All right. In my experience, the way you get the most value from your hand at this point is to just shove and let them think you have eight, seven, or two diamonds. I, I get called by high cards in 5-5 five, five a lot here when I do this at low stakes. Like, th this isn't going to work at higher stakes uh, games. Like, everybody knows this play. But, you know, like, if you're playing, like, small stakes and micro stakes, you will get guys to just... Uh, if he's got, like, ace-nine suited, ten-nine suited, like, jack-nine, he's never folding. Eight-sevens... Honestly, it's very rare to find a guy like folding that. It, we don't know if he's opening like a 6-7 suited or something like that. But, you know, stranger things have happened. So we'll go with that. All right. Here we go. I'm not going to be there to read the situation out to you when you play. So you got to do this. All right. Would you like to fold, call, or raise to 2.2K? All right. <laughs> However, you can talk to yourself when you play cards, just like tennis. If you find yourself like not playing the way you want to talk to yourself, it gives you a different present of mind. Just got to talk, get, wake up. Uh, you still have enough, enough equity to call a min raise here, but you want to be careful versus a player this tight. Since he raises 5% of the hands overall, he would typically love it if you re-raised him. If you folded, that's fine. Okay, so we call. Again, a fold was totally fine here, given his stats. And it goes check, check on the flop. And the turn's the five of hearts. And it's on you. Would you like to check? Would you like to bet 40% of the pot? Would you like to bet 60% of the pot? Or would you like to bet 80% of the pot? Uh, you can bet something small here when tight players check back on this coordinated of a board. Uh, they're letting you know they missed. Nits never check back and overpair on that coordinated of a board. They intimately remember all the times their overpair got outdrawn. Those are traumatic experiences to them. They don't, you, you can tell they're traumatic experiences because they talk about it all the time in the card room like it's the worst thing that ever happened to them. And it's like, buddy, if the worst thing that ever happened to you is your kings got cracked, like that's a pretty good life. Uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, they, they don't want to get outdrawn again. He, he's telling you he has big cards that miss because he never checked back something that he doesn't want to get outdrawn here. Uh, just take the pot from him. All right, we're going to finish today with some extra credit ends. I'm going to give you a minute with the next slide. You're playing in one of these low stakes tournaments and you pull up this pop-up. This is H Rampage. This is about how big the pop-up will be if you are playing online. Take a minute.
All right, a few more seconds, guys. Let do some housekeeping in my office. All right. You can pause if you want more time. I'm sure most of you have that capability by now. All right. You raise here on the button and get two calls. Both players check to you. What would you like to do? Would you like to check? Bet 20% pot, 33, 50, 66. What would you like? Any flavor you like. All right. Honestly, whoa. <laughs> Remember, if they have high cards, they'll usually assume someone has something in a multi-way pot. They're much more likely to fold. If they have a pair, probably no bet will get them to fold. So let's just try betting really small here. You get check raised here. Your move. Let me show you the sizing again. All right. All right. A couple more seconds. All right. Remember that answer. Let's look at another situation. You raise and get called by the same gentleman. The board comes, eight of diamonds, four of diamonds, two of clubs, and he goes ahead and leads out to you, into you. What would you like to do? All right, let's dissect this player. Um, when you got check raised here, you were faced with this decision. In this case, you want to raise something that doesn't give this aggressive player post-flop enough room to work. If you make it 200k, he can come back. Like, actually, you can call here, but when I'm teaching, the, the problem with that is you got to have, like, really deep, like, uh, turn and river understanding and, like, a really good read on your guy. And a lot of times... The guy, when a lot of people recommend call there, I think they're handling like turns and rivers much differently than a lot of uh, the guys that are taking that advice. So I get worried about that. So I, when I'm teaching and I was trying to do this with uh, these uh, micro stakes and small stakes tournaments, I, I'm trying to show like total exploitative plays that are really easy to implement. And the easiest one to implement here is uh, raised to 250K. Uh, uh, go going back in this case you want to raise something that doesn't give this aggressive player post flop enough room to work if you make it 200k he can come back if you're raising again here it's because you think he has a post flop bluff in his game so if you leave him the room to post flop bluff it stands to reason he just might take that uh so we make it 274,000 here and he goes ahead and folds Part of the reason you bet that small is to hopefully induce that. Because think about it. Like, how many combos does he really check raise there? It's like a set of sixes, a set of fours, a set of twos. And, like, nobody check raises the nut flush draw there anymore. Uh, when I hear people range that way, I'm like, when was the last time you saw that? Like, everybody, I mean, it does happen, but you just don't see it as much as you used to. So you can't just, like, automatically put all those combinations in the guy's range. Uh, and it, you know, people will also say like, oh, you could have tens too. That's a really good value comment. It's like, yeah. And like really low stakes that does sometimes happen, but a lot of guys just call that. So again, you can't count on the combo. So it's like, it's really hard to give this guy a value hand there. I, I think what happened is, you know, I mean, this is just kind of the war of the exploitative, uh, like, <laughs> uh, exploits, right. Um, uh, <laughs> that was terrible. Uh, but uh, it's war of the exploitative plays. Uh, you know, you bet like 20000 into that board. Like most people wouldn't do that with a value hand. So he's like, all right, I'll raise and I'll take this. But like you're a step ahead of him. And you know he wouldn't do that either with many hands. And when you saw this situation, you were faced with this decision.
here you should raise to 65k. This was a raise. Uh, let's discuss why these plays work. Did you see what I saw in this pop-up? And th this is some of the, if you guys didn't get this, like this is some of the hardest stuff. Uh, it, like this stuff took me a long time to learn and it's really hard to like eyeball it really quickly and to get it. And it's totally fine if you missed it. Uh, this entire pop-up is fascinating. But what really caught my eye is that WTSD went to showdown. Uh, he really likes to fight post-flop and try to take pots. That's his thing. He likes to get to flops and then fight. His post-flop aggression frequency of 58% is uh, high. Uh, that means he takes an aggressive action nearly 6 times out of 10 post-flop. And that holds up on the big bat streets of the turn and river. As you can see, turn aggression, river aggression frequency. Uh, now... When someone donk leads, what is the most important stat to look at? It's not donk bet. What do you think it is? It's fold the C bet. If the person's fold the C bet is 60%, he can't really be donk leading garbage because he's check folding all of that. Or, you know, I that tends to be what happens when a guy check folds 60% of the time. That That is... You miss the board like, you know, you have like third pair or worse 60% of the time or fourth pair or worse 60% of the time. And guys who fold about that much, you know, they're fairly honest. So dong betting without the hand, that's a fairly dishonest play. But it's so you want to look for that. And if you see the person's fold to see if it as 60%, you can't really be donk leading garbage because he's check folding all of the garbage most of the time. But at 46% here, he did have the capability to donk lead some junk, and we can see some indicators of post-flop bluffing behavior with these aggression frequencies. Looking at this in the spots, he was attacking low boards where it was unlikely anyone had anything. This was very much an indication of a low-stakes player who has some chops post-flop and usually gets away with his bluffs. We just have to be one step ahead. Normal session. Hope you enjoyed my attempt to simulate a normal grinder session. As you can see, most of the time you're folding. Actually, when I play, I'm folding more than this. Sometimes in poker training, coaches have to focus on teaching the more difficult plays, which gives the impression we're never folding. Folding is what creates profit. Final notes. Big bluffs come up rarely. <laughs> Excuse me. Big bluffs come... Wow. Big bluffs come up rarely. And you usually only do them when a specialized situation comes up. Remember, just because there's a number you can reference, that doesn't mean that number is helpful for your particular situation. You have to contextualize everything you see with game situations, positions, stack sizes, etc. Put all these things together and grind hard. You'll be making final tables in no time. All right, guys, that's my time today. Take care. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I hope you're enjoying the Thanksgiving Day Marathon. I hope you're soaking up all of this great content that we produced over at PokerCoaching.com. And I want to tell you about my Black Friday sale that's taking place right now where you can get up to 78% off many of the amazing products I've made and my coaches have made over the last few years. So, for the first time ever, I made a gigantic tournament masterclass. This thing is over 30 hours long, not even including the many hand reviews that I made to go along with this, including wins in regular tournaments, PKO tournaments, and satellites. You can actually only get the Cash Game Masterclass if you are a member of Poker Coaching Premium. And normally, we charge 99 bucks a month for Poker Coaching Premium. But if you subscribe for a three-year subscription, you can actually get it for less than the regular price of the Poker Coaching Standard Membership. You can get three years for $1,399. It's a little bit less than $39 per month. And if you want to get good at poker tournaments or cash games, well, this is for you. Also, we have a Poker Coaching Membership where you get access to loads of content, including over 1,000 quizzes. Also, we have lots and lots of classes. We have a monthly homework assignment that I go through and make sure all the students are playing well. 
Um, we have a Discord channel. We have a vibrant community. All of that is there at pokercoaching.com. Regular price is $39 per month. But if you sign up for a three-year membership, it's $299 for three years, which comes out to $8.30 per month. How much is that per day? Not a lot, like 30 cents per day. Hate to break it to you. If you have any desire to be good at poker, you probably need to be spending more than 30 cents per day on high level educational content like we have at pokercoaching.com. Here's one of my students, Blas Zerzhao. You may have heard of him. He turned $5 into 1.3 million on Party Poker a few years ago. Um, and then just recently, this last year, he turned 100 bucks into $400,000 again on Party Poker. He says PokerCoaching.com has helped him lay strong foundations to excel at No Limit Hold'em games and to further work on his game with my help. He's absolutely crushing it. His results are not typical. I don't have results that good over the last few years, but he has been absolutely crushing it. He's been a Poker Coaching member for a very long time. Like we said, you can get Poker Coaching Premium now for less than the price of Poker Coaching Standard if you sign up for three years. As you see, loads and loads and loads and loads of content. I didn't even mention our GTO preflop charts. We have extensive GTO preflop charts. There's an app for your phone. You can access those on your phone and the vast majority of the material we discussed here. We also have 30-day challenges to give you little bits of content every day to ensure that you are working hard and developing good study habits. Because if you study even 30 minutes a day, every day, you're going to be really good at poker in about a year or so. So we make sure that all of our students are doing that. Like I said, you can get three years for only $1,399. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. And, 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 understand that I created poker coaching premium to give you all the tools and training that you will ever need to achieve your full potential as a poker player. That is what I want for you. But if for some reason you think I have failed to deliver on that promise, I do not want or deserve your money. I am not running a training site here where I'm just trying to get your money up front and then quit poker and not teach you anything else and not provide additional content. We are consistently hiring the best players in the world to teach you how to succeed at poker. And if you think I fail at that, ask me for a refund and I will give it to you. No questions asked. You have 30 days after you sign up. If you don't like it, ask for a refund. No questions asked. You'll get your money back because look, if I don't help you, I don't deserve it. Simple as that. I don't really know how I can be any more fair. So that's it. Hope you are enjoying this Thanksgiving Day Marathon. Thank you very much for taking time to watch it. Hope you learn a little bit. Hope you learn a lot. You might as well. And again, if you want to sign up for PokerCoaching.com to get access to all of this stuff that we've discussed, I know it's a lot, but if you want access to all of this stuff, go to PokerCoaching.com slash Black Friday. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the show.